Hey all, I'm really glad you were able to make it to my talk. I'm excited about the state of the source. It's been the one conference I've been looking forward to during this pandemic, and I'm, I'm so thrilled to talk to you. And how relevant, we're gonna talk about communication channels. How do we keep in touch with each other over this wild internet of ours? And how maybe IRC isn't the right solution for us today. I say that not to create some sort of beef with anybody, but I just want us to get to think outside of our normal worldview here. And I have some data to support this idea. You can find the slides on speaker deck. So I'm Matt, I work as a technical editor on opensource.com uh, for Red Hat. And there I get to coach and encourage community members to write about their open source experiences. It's a really fascinating blend of everything from deep dives on Kubernetes to learning Python to what's your first experience with Linux but it's telling technical stories and I love coaching people through that. I also joined the OSI and the PSF, uh, the Python Software Foundation, and I'm a contributor to Kubernetes through a working group and a maintainer in the chaos community. I also recently graduated from a, a partial graduate program called the Business of Open Source out of Brandeis that comes with an OSI approval and guidance. So it taught me a lot more about the foundations of open source, and uh, I've been learning that as, a, as I go here. So it's been great to solidify that through a course, and I highly re recommend you check it out. So to anchor us in this conversation, take a moment and think, where were you and what tools were you using to chat with the first open source community that you felt like you were a member of, that you felt included in? Okay, with that in the back of your head, let's roll through history a little bit. So IRC, released in 1988, but I say by the early 90s, it just seemed to take up the free space of where are people gonna talk about open source online. It wasn't quite as popular as uh, it is today, open source that is, but um, the conversation was happening there. If we fast forward another 10 years or so, we land in the early 2000s where IRC, pretty strong following, 240,000 people are hanging out on there. And there are just some behemoths, though, competing for chat space. You have ICQ, which will, ever live for, will forever live in my heart. You have MSN Messenger that had well over 100 million users, which is just crazy. Um, and then Yahoo was a beast of its own time. When I talk to IRC enthusiasts, they always remind me that all of those channels have since uh, become deceased. And in their mind, in that headspace, it is only empty space around it. There is only IRC. But times have changed quite significantly. When we, we take a look around us, you see Slack with a whopping 44 million users, uh, which is just absolutely dominating many of the communities I see and participate in. Gitter's involved with 100K, and Element, formerly Riot.im, with its matrix uh, underlying protocol, is an open source alternative that's coming out pretty strong with 18 million users just recently. So it's great to see, but even these, these don't even compare to some of the other networks that we spend time on in our day. We see Twitter with over 300 million, so that's way bigger than MSN Messenger ever was. Telegram is even bigger, who knew? I didn't. Um, and then Reddit is the beast that it is. And even beyond those, Discord, very popular in the gaming community, has an increasingly open source centric space uh, and even has open source some of its code and seems to intend to do more in that space. So there are a ton of channels that are available to us and those are just the ones we want to talk about. The one no one wants to talk about is Facebook with 2.6 billion users, uh, allegedly. I, I worry about how many of them are, are bots just like the rest of us. But putting that aside, this isn't an advertisement for using the largest channel by any means, but it is an acknowledgement of this question that we started with. Where did you first come from when you engage with open source communities? My impression is that if you're a fan of IRC, you started on IRC. Maybe a mailing list as well, but IRC was that place where you connected with people for the first time in the open source community. For me, on the other hand, GitHub was the place that made me feel welcome. I didn't even know what I was doing would be considered open source, but I opened a pull request uh, and shared information and improved a project I absolutely adored 
before I really understood what I was doing. And not only that, I got to banter with people about it on Twitter after, which is my preferred chat platform. And in that way, you, the seasoned open source professional, see me, the GitHub generation of open source, as maybe a foreign species to some degree. Uh, you know the OSD from heart, can recite all the parts of it. And I only in the last year through that course figured out that FSF, the Free Software Foundation, and the Open Source Initiative were different. Sorry, I know it's a big deal, but it didn't. It, I just didn't know it. Um, you have had to live through subversion and other forms of version control, while Git has been a common denominator for me throughout my whole career. And you've been active on IRC this whole time. I just joined because Element made it easy. More on that later. But what brings us together as a collective community and what I hope you will see in me and what I see in you is that we really care about open source communities and we want each one of ours to grow and succeed and to connect with users that need it. We don't make this just for the heck of it. We make it to share and to create that commons that can be cultivated communally. So when a new user, and this is my experience firsthand, uh, is using IRC, they look at it like, what is this wizard-like syntax? You know, having a CS degree and working in technology and data centers for 10 years still didn't prepare me to try to figure out how to chat on this platform when I was so used to Twitter or I was so used to GitHub. And name server, for God's sakes, just doesn't seem to respect me as a person. It, it will give away my username every time I try to log in from a different machine. So, you know, these may be naive questions and you're watching this like, hey, I can fix this for you. But that's not the point. It's the point is that the bar for a new user is higher than ever. And IRC doesn't quite hit those points that are just seen as basic by other standards. So if we talk about the sign up experience and having an account where I can configure it, that I can then sign into that account through my mobile device, or I have onboarding to figure out what the heck is the syntax of this new tool, because every new tool is a little different. Do I have moderation options that makes this safe for people so that they can mute trolls or, um, or mute conversations that aren't good for them, aren't healthy for them? Um, is there a shared discussion history, just something out of the gate that, yes, I know there are extensions for IRC, but out of the gate, it is complex and confusing to find. And then multimedia support. I, I really like emojis. I think it's one of the few ways we can express ourselves through reasonably plain text these days. And without those, it's you're really silencing a lot of conversation. So there's a lot of things, including the notifications, that are also important because we're on so many different channels and have so many different tools. If I can't tune my notifications, I probably won't actually look when people are talking. IRC doesn't offer these, and Slack and Element absolutely do. So Slack being the dominant proprietary option and Element, formerly Riot.im, is just taking over as the great alternative. And that really, is, it shows in the numbers, right? So this is from a site that's been tracking IRC since its very beginning. And the numbers as of 2020 uh, are looking pretty low compared to the high point in 2004. Um, and that is shrinking uh, at a time when open source is more popular than ever. So the correlation of those two things just doesn't bode well for IRC as a, as a primary communication channel. But I hear you, I hear you screaming through the microphone. Yes, but IRC has principles that I really value. You value an open source license. You value the decentralized nature so no one owns, owns it. And you value end-to-end -end encryption that yes, most people layer on top of their IRC config to, to give them that independence and that sovereignty over their info. And I totally get it, but those are not enough to make IRC the only answer. Element and Rocket Chat are fantastic. And if you ignore Federated, and uh, you can get Zulip in there pretty quickly as well. And they're all great chat apps. So just looking at Rocket and Element, because they're my top two in this category, they all still meet the requirements that IRC cannot out of the box. Uh, and, and that really matters to users who are used to a more full-fledged, more, uh, more modern experience. So with all due respect, IRC is not the right tool for new users. So I can't tell you what's right for you and the maintainers of the project, but as a new user, 
as somebody who's trying to attract somebody, you have to accept that they are not going to jump in and know what they're doing there. So what does it look like to choose a community channel? We've been zoomed in on one very specific part of a bigger challenge, and I wanna offer uh, a model to help you think through it in the future. When designing a community experience, I, I break it into four quadrants, that there's synchronous communication where there's a casual conversation going on that really keeps the buzz going, keeps people communicating over time. When you have, uh, on the other hand, you have asynchronous communication, which gives you the definitive record of truth. It's your question and answer type forums. It's your asynchronous way in which you can, it's a mailing list by default is, is very common, but there are other tools that are available these days. In face-to-face, -face, it brings us together and it creates those bonds that last lifetimes. And then people do need news outlets, which we end up filling accidentally. But if you map out communities, you'll see they consistently have a channel in which you find the authoritative truth of what's going on. So we're only zoomed in on synchronous, which includes a set of technologies that differ from these other ones. So we're only talking about one fourth of this challenge and it gets more complicated with time. But I show this all to say that all communities are multi-channel and all communities have a bunch of tools. Uh, so looking at synchronous, yes, it is helpful for us to start here because it's what everyone is used to, but I just wanna note that it's rarely the right place for a community to start. If you're starting from scratch, think about asynchronous communication. Think about how you're going to be able to break people out of these limitations that are inherent to synchronous. Uh, how they require always on participation and how it creates a, a culture of immediacy for everybody and it automatically makes it more difficult for people outside of a time zone to participate. Probably my least favorite part of synchronous communication is that great knowledge is given and lost every single day. If I give an an answer on how to set up a environment for testing and somebody else shows up the next day and ask it, I'm not gonna ask them to roll back and, and search for it. It's gone on most tools. So I love asynchronous because it really focuses in on prolonging knowledge sharing and giving people this uh, choosing, people can choose their own time of day to participate in open source. They don't have to be on at all times. But let's say synchronous is the right place for your community at this time. I'd like people to think a little bit bigger. So it's going to be more advanced, but let's say you're already in IRC, which is your preferred place. Cool. Do that thing. But use elements. Um, They're not paying me for this, but I've found that I love what they do here. They offer a bridge to use IRC protocol uh, and connect it to another channel inside their community. So you can bridge that connection, make the same channel from IRC in Elements um, under this idea of a community, which in many ways is like an entire Slack team. You have multiple channels in there that are associated and using the same apps. So you can do that. And then on top, you can layer a community contributors channel so that people who are newer can banter and get to know each other. And now you're building tiers of relationships where your maintainers can chat and people can pop in and ask questions and those are synced. And then community contributors are doing their thing. That can be really, really satisfying. If you wanna go even more advanced, add a third channel. Uh, they, they can connect together through bridges um, so you can add Slack to your configuration, use channels there to map to your element one your IRC community is still doing its thing, but you're growing this multi-channel conversation that is where people prefer to converse. And if you wanna get a, a ton more visibility, add some bots that are taking Mastodon traffic and Twitter traffic and posting it into your, your channel so that you can go and then respond to them if you find interesting people there. So you're really starting to get a broader range of experience and awareness and find that broader range of people that care about your project by being on the channels that they choose to be on. And the future is it's going to be where the contributors are, not necessarily where you want to be all the time. So thinking about that and putting it all together, um, it, it really, I hope my example is one that kind of makes this make sense that I started from proprietary hardware company out of college, not knowing what I was building or how it related to anything open source. 
I had to learn Linux for that job a little bit, and then I learned a little bit more. But slowly but surely, I found this way into an open source ecosystem that brought me a ton of joy. And it was only after I participated for many years that I had any idea what I was participating in. And now, as somebody who's a maintainer and contributor to multiple large projects and small ones as well, I find it so satisfying, and I really want other people to be able to find this with a little bit more ease than myself. And the communication channels really are the choice that will allow people to either be part of this from the beginning or feel excluded from the beginning. Uh, our goal is, should not be that they, to tell people to try harder to communicate with us. Um, that is within reason. As a maintainer, if you are already overworked, you don't have to do all of this. We shouldn't be making people feel dumb for not knowing IRC. And a way around that is to be multi-channel, to use the tools that are freely available to us to connect the dots between different channels and the users that prefer to be there. It's inclusive, it's engaging, and it really helps people find you and find this larger community of open source. So start with in inclusivity, and we can educate people on open values along the way. I didn't really care about privacy until I really read up on it more after being a regular contributor to projects and starting to see the history of open source as something that connects to privacy and connects to the licensing that matters behind it. So now that I'm there, I have a preference and bias towards that, but let's not expect people who aren't there yet to know it already. Um, we have to first invite people in before we can necessarily teach them um, what is important about open source, and maybe they won't care, but like use the channels that work for others. And if this isn't the type of work that you love doing, I totally get it. Recruit people who are into it. Recruit maintainers who aren't, say, coding all the time on your project, but think about the multidisciplinary skills needed in your community and recruit for it because this isn't trivial. And when we trivialize communication, it ends up poorly and your community suffers for it. So remember that the communities that contribute to open source are open source if they're on Slack, if they're on Twitter, if they're on Rocket Chat or IRC. We don't get to choose that definition that's implied by the open source definition. So be where people are, connect them to your cause and your your projects, and maybe on the way they will grow and learn more open source as well. I certainly have. So thank you so much. It's such an honor to be part of this project uh, from the Open Source Initiative. Uh, I want to also give props to Mozilla, who was very public about their choosing of their communication channel and inspired me to look into this more. And uh, I hope if you're interested in opensource.com, you'll reach out to me. But thanks, and let's go to Q&A. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Um, what a what a strange experience to be watching the conversation while hearing myself speak. But it was really fun and um, really happy to see people respond to this. Um, but I, I do want to take questions either on about your community and how to think about communication, um, or or just I'm okay with just statements as well. If there's a gap in my history here, I think there have been some great points that I don't want to miss next time in the next rev. So any questions to start? OK, that's the start of the question. OK, what's the first thing you'd use in a new project? Thank you, whoever gave me this layup. I appreciate you a lot. Um, my absolute favorite place to start these days, since I do try to have a bias towards asynchronous communication, so I don't accidentally create multiple pockets of community based on geos, based on uh, time zones, is to use discourse. It's it's free and open source license, um, fantastic community support. Uh, you can They have a very inexpensive hosted if you want them to run it for yourself. And my absolute favorite part of it is that if, you're, if uh, you have a multi-generations of open source contributors in the same space and some of them really want mailing lists and other people want a forum type experience with emojis like crazy, uh, Discourse provides both at the same time. Each of the categories you set up on Discourse, you can also configure as their own mailing list. And uh, then, so you have all the new tools and it works perfectly well as a plain text mailing list at the same time. So if you're gonna start with only one thing, Discourse is absolutely the thing I would start with.
Um, on the chat side, if you were really into to chat only, uh, I'm really enjoying Element. Um, it still has a couple of the gnarly, hey, can I talk to your version of name server configuration things? Um, but I think it's getting so good that, um, and it aligns really well with the, the culture of, of our community in the open world. But um, really start with what your community needs. So thinking from who is coming into the space and how do I uh, make them feel welcome? And if that means you have to set up Slack, whether you like it or not, like give that a go. If it means your community is really active on Facebook, um, start there and pull them off as soon as possible if you're willing to. I think um, I'm, I try to be very open to where my community is uh, and then slowly draw them to where I would prefer us being. So number two, uh, where are the next generation of contributors? Maybe specifically thinking 18 to 25 demographic. Um, I, I think they're out there. I mean, they're by, if you follow GitHub state of the Octaverse, it's their year over year metrics of growth and participation. Um, the participation and the amount of repositories on GitHub in particular are always up and to the right. Same goes for GitLab. Um, I see reports from the Apache Foundation and the Linux Foundation, and CNCF, that contribution is, at, uh, is, is up and to the right as well. And there are some interesting academic reports showing that people are contributing. Um, so the, it seems that there's a large agreement that there is more contribution. Um, and then I can't speak for all younger people, but I am seeing through some of the communities that reach out specifically to universities, there's an increasing amount of open source interest in that space. Uh, RIT just announced that they have an OSPO and are teaching an open source uh, minor, I believe and are encouraging contribution. Uh, someone spoke there at, at this event and we're working on an article on opensource.com. And I work with some uh, wonderful people uh, through the chaos community who a lot of them are college students who are doing their very first pull request of the project and it's, it's fantastic. So um, for better or worse, I think it does aggregate on GitHub because it has the glossiest uh, experience and people tend to gravitate there. Um, but I, I bet there are a lot of cases that I'm not privy to and are very, you know, based on geography. Um, if other people have thoughts on there, please add comments to the, the shared notes on where younger people are contributing from. I'd love to hear your take. So any thoughts on best practices for information management between corporate and public open source channels? Uh, yeah, coordinating between multiple issue trackers and channels. Yes, that was my beast of burden for about two years at Intel, um, slowly trying to get us to be developing a couple of our cloud projects in the open as opposed to behind in a, in a closed JIRA, um, but through open issues, through GitHub management, uh, since that's where the project was. And I, I'd say try to find the places where you can uh, push the boundaries a little bit. Um, so we, we absolutely had to use an internal JIRA tracker, but um, there was no rule against us connecting that JIRA tracker to a GitHub ticket through a bot. So we made a bot to do so, and we had uh, bi-directional uh, synchronization. And if you can get bi-directional, that is absolutely ideal. Uh, I know that is ideal, which means you're not gonna get it every time. But the same goes for if you can get the communication channels to be public by default, um, and uh, you can do a lot. And there are good reasons to that would take a much longer argument to make. Um, so if, if you want to talk more about that, uh, I'd love to dig into it. But um, maybe some of the data from Chaos or from CNCF on like how effective it is to contribute in public will help support that argument. Because ultimately, it's a risk reward conversation with some executive sponsor. And if you can figure out what their decision ma decision making matrix looks like, you can push them towards the direction that you hope for. Cool. All right. Last but not least, uh, where would you suggest a project start that's actively attempting to bring people into tech? So not generally tech savvy already. That is, um, a really wonderful, uh, wonderfully complex question. I, I think I quite honestly don't have the most experience there um, to be uh, blunt. I And so I end up 
um, I helped my a couple of my friends who are teachers in like uh, the the city of Minneapolis where I live, and I tried to talk to them about how they're getting their students to adopt technology right now through remote learning, and you know getting them to jump on IRC for instance was not out of the question. Um, but when I showed them kind of the litany of tools we just went over here, they did land on discourse as something that might make sense to one group of the the high school students they're working with and other another friend of mine landed on slack and they're like slack is great for them they get it it makes sense and it's kind of like the sandbox environment um, so for the less tech savvy um i think no matter what you choose it's it's really i would be looking very closely at the onboarding tools and whether you can customize onboarding to be very thoughtful um, and then it's more about like, what are you doing as a community leader to giving people support along the way? Um, for me, that that I think about office hours regularly where people can come in with unstructured questions, um, really good channels for structured questions online, uh, and then one-to-one -one outreach of find your influencers in your community who you know may be more vocal about the challenges than other people and get them to explain what's going on and collaboratively you know, share that through whatever news outlet you've created. Um, so think about, I mean, most projects can benefit from having a very simple blog attached to it in, in that news space. And you can talk about the challenge of onboarding to this new project and write it up and have all those tutorials turn into a source of communication that helps your community grow. Um, so thinking about those quadrants, I didn't have time to get into them. That's an hour long talk in and of itself. Um, but thinking about how you interact across these channels, like how a synchronous communication turns into an asynchronous answer and that asynchronous answer turns into a news outlet. And then you have a face to face or virtual meeting to talk about it in more detail. And then you go around the circle again. So I think communicating a ton will be the, the way you get over that pain. Because I mean, one way or the other, um, learning technology, even when you're good at some other technology is incredibly painful. And if you haven't learned something new recently and uh, please go do that and just feel as foolish as you feel when you don't know how to do something and you're really good at a bunch of other stuff. So think about that whenever you're trying, trying to adopt a technology and uh, be ready to help people through that and make it normal to be learning and to ask questions.